Hello, my name is Dr. Su Fong, and I'm the director of curriculum and instruction at Cobalt Education. I am so excited to share this wonderful professional development webinar with you. Our presenter today is Dr. Karen Hess. She is an international leader in curriculum and assessment development. She has guided over 35 states and U.S. territories in developing a rigorous, competency-based curriculum that focuses on the mastery of skills. She is well known for her cognitive rigor matrices, which focus on understanding what cognitive demand looks like in a classroom, and tailoring assessments with performance tasks to that demand. I think you will find what Dr. Hess has to say will empower you with the tools to further deepen learning in your classroom. Enjoy. Welcome to a webinar series, Deeper Competency-Based Learning. In this series, we are going to explore what is competency-based learning, why would a school want to do it, and mostly focus on strategies for how to implement competency-based learning. My name is Karen Hess, and I am one of the authors of the book, Deeper Competency-Based Learning. We put this book together with my colleagues, Rose Colby and Dan Joseph, bringing our areas of expertise together. I have a background in uh, assessment and curriculum. Rose's background, also a former teacher, um, is on leadership. And Dan's background, also as a teacher and principal, um, likes to go into schools and do coaching with schools moving towards competency-based learning. So I'm providing their information should you want to also reach out to them at any point during the series. This series is divided into several sessions. In the first session, which is this one, I'm gonna give you a little history about competency-based education in the US. We're gonna to start to explore the components of competency-based education, and you'll have a little homework. Each uh, session will end with a little homework activity where you're going to be asked with your colleagues to begin to develop a profile of the graduate of your school. What do you want them to be able to know and do. In session two, we'll, I'll introduce depth of knowledge. That's what uh, many people know me for around the world. And we're gonna use depth of knowledge to think about how do we deepen learning for students. We're gonna make connections between standards-based and competency-based education. And you're going to be given some tools to begin to craft some academic competencies and personal skills competencies. And you'll understand that more as we go on. Sessions three to six all focus on the how. We will explore classroom strategies to build a classroom culture. And you will learn how to create assessments and consider grading and reporting practices for competency-based learning. I wanna say a couple words about the book. You don't have to purchase the book, but obviously if you have the book and the staff in your school has the book, you would be able to read more, discuss more in greater depth than I can possibly cover in the webinar. We would like, even if you don't have the book and you only participate in the on-demand webinar, that you make your learning both individually reflective and also collaborative. Whenever you can, discuss these ideas with your colleagues. There will be certain slides that will reference page numbers in the book. They will um, suggest a collaborative activity or a reflective thinking activity. This is all copyrighted material. So if you use it, just please give us a full citation. And if your school wants to order multiple copies, you can contact a Corwin representative for your region. They will give you a pretty good discount on books. A little bit about how the book is organized. Uh, chapter one focuses on what is competency-based learning and why would um, this approach be evolving over the last decade? That's gonna be the focus of this session as well. 
Chapters two to four really are about the how. These are the different shifts. The first shift, shift in chapter two is the organizational shift. What are your policies? Uh, what, are, what are your leadership strategies? This series is not gonna focus that much on that except to just introduce it. This series will spend more time in teaching and learning structures, uh, designing assessments, validating assessments and student-centered classrooms, which is chapter four. All the chapters have some suggested tools and reflective activities that I won't provide all of, but you may wanna go back and use them with your faculty. And each strategy throughout the book is linked to John Hattie's visible learning influencers. So we will say, if you use this strategy, this is why you want to use this strategy because there is research to say, this will improve learning. There are also three appendices, the CBE tools. Whenever I say use CBE tool one or two, they're in the first appendix. Appendix B are my cognitive rigor matrices. There are eight of them. And then Appendix C has additional resources that you might want to explore on your own. So we use the gear visual on the cover of the book because we want to show the interrelatedness of the organizational shifts that a school will be making. Um, what's the professional culture? What, how do you identify learning? that's necessary um, for the, the professional culture to move forward with their understanding. Um, one example I will give you, I have several schools that I've been working with for several years and they will from time to time ask me to come in and they say, we have some new questions. Could we explore these questions with you? So those are the kinds of uh, professional learning that happen um, in the moment when things come up. So you can't plan for that <laughs> up front. And as I said, most of the work in this webinar series will not focus on these shifts. The bulk of what um, I will be talking about are the teaching and learning shifts. Um, what are your competencies? You might have academic content-based, but also personal competencies, like the ability to collaborate, the ability to um, set goals. Those are personal skills. Performance assessments, we'll spend a whole session on that. And we'll spend a session on how do you grade and report? How is that like standards-based grading, but how is it different when a competency bundles a bunch of standards? And then finally, student-centered classrooms, we will focus on a few of these shifts, looking at pacing, how to give feedback to students and how students can build a body of evidence that's used for grading and reporting. So that's the big, the big picture of how the book is organized. Um, I mentioned that from time to time there would be a stop and reflect. So what I'd like you to do is consider this question. If you're just starting out with competency-based education or perhaps if you're new to the book, what's a question you would like the book to answer for you and why? Whenever you see the stop and reflect, I would suggest you stop the video and take a few minutes to write your reflection. So we'll begin session one. The visual I use for this one is it's a new paradigm and it truly is a different way of thinking about how we organize a school, how we organize instruction and learning and how we give over some ownership to students. So we're gonna focus on the what of CBE, competency-based education and the why. So starting with what is competency-based education, we'll start with a definition. And sometimes you'll hear it referred to as mastery-based, proficiency-based, or sometimes performance-based. But it's all fairly similar. And it means that a school or a district-wide structure is in place that's going to take the place of many of the inequitable practices, such as tracking. Um, the idea of competency-based education is every student is going to be successful. We're not gonna to try to sort students and have different expectations for different students. That's probably the biggest shift. It's not the same as competency skills checklist that were typically used for career and technical education or back in the 1980s, it was often called the trade schools where 
there was a list of skills. And if you completed all of these skills successfully, um, you would be certified to be an auto mechanic, for example. Nowadays, you're an auto technician. The skills are much more complex, but it still is not just a checklist of skills that you complete and move on. In 2019, the Aurora Institute, which is the group that spearheaded this whole movement towards competency-based education and supported a lot of the work of schools across the US, um, came up with a definition of competency-based education, which I will share in a couple of minutes. So first let's look at a little bit of the history and you'll notice that this comes from pages 11 to 13 in the book. Actually, if you look at this timeline, 2011 is not that long ago, but in 2011, a group of states that were talking about and beginning to use competency-based strategies came together and developed a definition, a working definition of what competency-based education was. Um, they got input from uh, people from across many states. And then INACOL, which later became Aurora, the Aurora Institute, began to publish the definition and supporting documents. In 2012, this is what um, the Aurora Institute published to show us who is actually starting this process. So um, the advanced states of Maine, New Hampshire, Iowa, and Oregon had begun to have policies that started to shift graduation requirements. So instead of graduation requirements being all about Carnegie units, you could barely pass a course with a D minus, but you could graduate. They were saying, no, we don't want this to be about how many courses you took. We want it to be about how much learning is taking place. And you'll see by the other colors of the states, other states were starting to consider to come on board or districts within those states were saying, we want some flexibility with graduation requirements. That's what it looked like in 2012. In 2019, this is what it looked like and actually looks pretty close to that today. Although Wyoming in the news last week is now in the process of developing a profile of the Wyoming graduate, which you're gonna, is gonna be your homework to be thinking about. So they are also coming along. This is a multi-year process. The advanced states here all have some kind of policy that says, we're changing the requirements for graduation. We're giving flexibility to schools to decide how they're going to approach competency-based education. Doesn't mean every school is doing everything the same way, but they have, they're on a similar path. So this is the definition uh, that was put out by the Aurora Institute after that first meeting in 2011. And I'm not gonna read every word to you, but the idea of, empowering students to make decisions about learning. Think about how often that has happened in traditional education. That assessment is positive and meaningful. It empowers students. That students get timely feedback based on individual needs. And this becomes a tricky piece for a lot of teachers at first. They say, well, how can I do that? How can kids be moving ahead at different rates? There are ways to do it, but it's tricky if you've never done it that way. When I started teaching, I didn't do it that way. Students progress based on mastery. So in session three, we'll actually look at how do you design your system so that kids are moving from one step to another step to another step. And once they're ready to move on, they do move on. It's not about how long it took them. Students learn actively. There are strategies that ensure equity. And this is the big one that runs throughout all of this. And then the last and most important probably is you start with rigorous common expectations. So we've always had the phrase learning goals um, from as long as I've been in education, but these are common. So these are expectations for all kids. And we want kids to have a rigorous curriculum and opportunities to be successful. They need to be able to transfer this learning to new situations. And that hasn't always been the case. 
So what are some of the implications? And if you notice the little icon up there, that little icon says, after I give these directions, you may wanna stop if you're viewing this with colleagues and spend a little time discussing these implications. The first is, what is the implications for giving kids ownership about how they learn or how they demonstrate learning? That might be one you might wanna discuss. How can you make assessment meaningful and positive rather than having test anxiety be um, what happens every time uh, students are tested? Students get timely support. What are the implications for that? And it's differentiated. Students advance upon mastery. Students learn actively and maybe take different pathways. Competencies ensure equity. All kids are expected to learn the same rigorous information or have opportunities. And the last, the competencies are explicit. So if we were in a room together, I would say, take five minutes at your tables, pick one of those and discuss it and then share with the larger group. Unfortunately, we're not all together in the same room, but you could design this for your needs. So we've had the big definition. Now let's look at some of the components that we're gonna pull apart in this series. First, we have academic competencies, and this visual is on page nine in your book, if you have the book. These are the content-based competencies. So if you're a math teacher or a science teacher, these are goals for building competency in science or math or art or health and physical education or in a CTE uh, course such as auto technology, um, graphic arts and so on. Personal success skills aren't gonna come from the standards. They are gonna come from skills that you believe in your school or possibly in your state are important life skills. So work habit skills, self-management skills, sometimes social emotional learning skills are wrapped into this. Some schools start with the personal success schools and then they integrate them with the academic. Once we have competencies established, we move to how we're gonna assess these competencies because they're more complex than anything we've ever stated before as a learning goal. We're gonna consider different pathways, how could students meet those goals, maybe using different assessments, a variety of assessments to be successful. And then how do we report on this? Because grading is no longer about averaging. It's not even about reporting on every standard. It's about looking at a body of evidence. Um, think of it as a portfolio. What would a student put into his or her portfolio to demonstrate learning over time? The real why of CBE is about equity. Traditional education has made schools equal, <laughs> like in this visual on the top, everybody's going to run the race, but it's not really equity because some people are gonna struggle a little bit more to go around that track. Equity is saying, well, what are the differences between those learners and how can we level the playing field so they all have an equal opportunity to finish that race? So this is an activity I'd like you to consider. You see the little icon uh, with the discussion. It's on page 22 in your book, and it's the first half of a table that we included comparing traditional education to competency-based education. And this is um, from a paper by Casey and Sturgis. It's kind of powerful, and you might even want to talk about each individual piece in depth, but this is the first five of 10 flaws. So in this session, we're only looking at the first five. We'll come back to the other five later. But the question for you is, do you have and support the same high expectations for every student? If you look at one flaw of traditional education, usually there's a narrow set of outcomes and maybe all students aren't expected to do the same kinds of things. And if you don't, have the same high expectations for all students, how could this be done or done more effectively in your school? So that's the prompt, that's some food for thought. This is a little bit longer discussion. Sometimes if we're in a workshop with teachers, we take a chunk of time to really pull this apart. But you could, it helps to sort of 
further elaborate on how a competency-based system is going to be different than what we've done traditionally. Now, some people might be thinking, what about standards-based? That's kind of a column in the middle that you don't see here. But standards-based starts to move away from the flaws of traditional system. It is in some ways similar to CBE, but there are some um, places where it, you'll find as we go on that it is a bit different. So take some time, read through this and really consider where are we now with our system? Are we somewhere on this pathway? And how could we get there? And after you have this conversation or even before you talk with your colleagues, this is a stop and reflect opportunity to say, what would be your why? Why do you think you in your own classroom or in your own school would like to consider moving towards a more competency-based system? You could do this before you all share ideas or you could do it after. Sometimes we help to solidify our understanding. And we know this from the classroom, when students discuss an issue or a text, and then they're asked, what do you think about it? They have a deeper understanding after that discussion. So feel free to use this reflection um, to move your thinking. You're going to have some homework now. Your homework is going to be developing a profile of the graduates of your school. And if you've never heard that phrase before, you're gonna be given some uh, tools to help you do that. Because before you can even think about what are our competency statements, what's our competency-based instruction and assessment, what are our policies, you actually have to say to yourself, what are the learning outcomes you want for every single student in your school? There are gonna be a small number of broad-based competencies or skills that cut across grade levels, content areas, courses. These are things that teachers can teach and support and model throughout the K-12 curriculum. The last slide has examples that you can look at and um, some steps you can take to build this. This comes from I, an article by um, Ken Kay. The title of the article was, um, The Graduate Profile is Your True North. And I pulled a couple phrases from that. There's a link to this article. But unlike a vision or mission statement, which is pretty broad and vague, and most schools have those, what are the cognitive, personal, and interpersonal skills or competencies that every student should have when they go leave high school and go out into the world? whether they're going to a, um, a job, um, a trade school, a um, college education. What do you want them all to be equipped with? You co-create this with the stakeholders. You're gonna start with your colleagues, but then you get feedback from the community and the students as well. The graduate profile then is the impetus for implementing certain strategies because this is sort of the, it is the true north. If we want this for all kids, what do we have to do? What do we have to change? I wanted to tell a little story about how I started this process with a school in Vermont. I am based in Vermont and this was a school who said, our school, if you remember Vermont was one of those earlier states that got involved, our school is moving towards a proficiency-based graduation. And we need to be thinking about what does that mean for us? So we actually spent a couple of days one summer um, to begin this work. And here's how we started. Everyone got three three by five index cards. And on those cards, they wrote three things they wanted all kids to be able to do when they left high school. So whole faculty was involved in that. And then a smaller group took those cards and sorted them into categories. And what came out of those categories was, first of all, many people said, we want the students to develop an understanding of themselves as a learner and how they interact with other people. And they came up with examples of where they thought they might be doing that right now. So some students had individual learning plans. Some students were involved in community service activities. 
Um, they said some teachers are giving personal interest surveys or when students lead a conference, a parent conference, and they share their best work. So this did two things. It validated that a lot of people thought this was important and they started to say, we're doing it now a little bit. Another area that came across was we want students to develop as a thinker. We want them in science to do investigations. We want them, we have a sophomore research paper or in math, we want to investigate um, performance task problems about st using statistical analysis. Um, in civics, we want them to analyze current events. So there were a lot of places where people were addressing this already, but it wasn't systematic yet. Another area was to be a good communicator. And again, they were starting to think about how are kids using technology? How are they integrating different ways to communicate? And then the last was to become a scholar, to pursue things that they were interested in and take it a little further. Uh, as a matter of fact, in uh, Rhode Island, I worked with Rhode Island um, on their proficiency-based graduation requirements. And one requirement was students have to identify an area of interest and then extend that learning and share what they learn. So it could be something they learn outside of school, anything from boat building to fashion design to photography, but something they might not be taught in school. So this was their starting point. And if you are looking for a starting point, you might wanna try this. They further refine these. They eventually, you see this is one, four, five, and 11. So this isn't the whole thing they came up with, but they they fall under these categories. And so these categories are helpful in thinking about um, a profile of a graduate needs to develop as a person, needs to be a thinker, a communicator, and so on. You may wanna read a little bit more on pages 33, 34 about their process. So the question for you is, do you already have a profile of the graduate? Are you using it to guide your work or is it just sort of post on the wall. And if you don't have one, how could you get started? In this, um, I'm gonna end this session with uh, giving you some resources. Um, if you look at the Ken K May 2017 article, he takes you step-by-step step how to develop a graduate profile. And that's um, a very helpful one. You also can go to Bataille for Kids and there is a link there. Take a look at how they suggest doing it. And then there are some examples that I've posted, one from Shelby County, Kentucky, one from South Carolina, one from Vermont. All of these give you a view into what other states are saying is important, but you should also see they're not the same. So what would be important in your profile of the graduate? Perhaps if you're viewing this first session and you've had time to work on this, you may wanna schedule time to get some feedback before you go on to session two. That ends session one. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you take time to stop and reflect and collaborate with your colleagues because that will deepen your learning. Thank you. <laughs>